Oftentimes, arguments and theories are given special status because their proponents are labeled, either by themselves or society at large, as experts, as if the title alone makes their case. This is known as credentialism and is an ever-looming rain cloud that constantly threatens to douse the fires of good thinking. A notable example of this phenomenon can be traced back to July 1917, when, in the English countryside near the Yorkshire County village of Cottingley, a pair of clever cousins would cause many experts to question reality and ignore the obvious. Having recently arrived from South Africa, Annie Griffiths and her nine-year-old daughter Frances took up residence with Annie's sister Polly and her family, husband Arthur Wright, and their 16-year-old daughter Elsie. The arrangement was a temporary one, while Mr. Griffiths served in the Great War. Nevertheless, the two families coexisted quite amicably, Francis and Elsie becoming fast friends. Free from school for the summer and free to explore a new land she now called home, young Francis spent the better part of one morning playing along a small stream known as the Beck that ran through an idyllic stretch of meadow behind the Wright's family garden. After a time, Frances returned to the house soaking wet, prompting a harsh scolding from her mother. Frances quickly explained that she'd fallen into the beck while playing with fairies. The claim was certainly nothing out of sorts for a child with a healthy imagination, and had it not been for her older cousin, the entire matter would have undoubtedly ended there. After being sent to her room to change, Frances told Elsie of the day's events, including the encounter with fairies. The teenager gave the matter some thought, and after some preparation, eagerly agreed to accompany Frances the following day. Before setting out, Elsie borrowed a camera from her father. An avid amateur photographer, Mr. Wright knew his daughter held similar interests to his own, and thought nothing odd about her wanting to record her adventures. When the girls arrived home some time later, they entered the house in triumph, excitedly imploring Mr. Wright to develop the exposed plate as soon as possible. Using a dark room he had built under the stairs of his Main Street house, Mr. Wright watched the finished image appear, a reasonably well-composed shot of Frances sitting behind some shrubbery on the bank of the back, her face cupped innocently. But there was also something strange just below Frances's face, what Mr. Wright described later as bits of paper in the image foreground. He asked his daughter what the anomalous features were, and Elsie replied that they were the fairies Frances spoke about. Willing to humor Francis, but less patient with Elsie, Mr. Wright filed the original plate away and chalked up the entire affair to childish nonsense. A little over a month later, Elsie again borrowed a camera from her father and set out for the garden, Francis in tow. As before, the girls returned and pestered Mr. Wright, who was confronted with another image of one of the girls and some sort of odd little creature. This time, the picture was of Elsie, sitting in the grass before the tree line, watching the gnome as it danced at her feet. Mr. Wright again asked for an explanation, and again was met with an outlandish story from a 16-year-old girl who should have known better. Irritated at having wasted both his time and developing fluid on an obvious prank, Mr. Wright forbade the girls from borrowing his camera henceforth. Polly Wright was a devotee of theosophy, an esoteric movement steeped in the spiritualism and pseudo-history that was all the rage of the early 20th century. Founded primarily by Russian medium Helena Blavatsky, Theosophy centers around the spiritual fraternity of all mankind and ancient occultic wisdom. While the former is certainly laudable, the latter involves uncritical belief in all manner of questionable ideas, including clairvoyance, extra bodily projection, and the existence of Atlantis, to name just a few. Whatever one's opinion of Blavatsky at all or their teachings, it cannot be said the followers of Theosophy are encouraged to be skeptical of extraordinary claims. Thus, when Polly saw the pair of photographs produced by her daughter and niece, she took it as a possible vindication of her theosophic beliefs. In 1919, accompanied by her sister, Polly took the pair of photographs to a meeting of the Theosophical Society in the town of Harrogate. She showed the photos to a lecturer, who, impressed with the apparent hard evidence of the supernatural, brought them to the attention of the General Secretary of the English Section of the Theosophical Society, Edward Gardner. Gardner quickly obtained the original plate negatives from Polly Wright and subsequently loaned them to photographic expert Harold Snelling for a professional opinion. In Gardner's view, quote, What Snelling doesn't know about faked photography isn't worth knowing, unquote. A man with over 30 years' experience, Snelling examined the photographs and found them quite convincing, concluding that the dancing figures were neither made of paper nor fabric, that they were not painted on a photographic background, and that the photos were of a single exposure, eliminating the possibility of the double exposure trickery commonly used in hoaxes. Snelling noted that plate number one in particular showed evidence of being produced instantaneously, meaning the use of a high shutter speed, and that the fairies had moved during the brief exposure, a rather debatable conclusion that Gardner doggedly defended. 
Tied to this opinion of authenticity, the fairy photographs quickly passed through the hands of the British spiritualist community, eventually gaining the attention of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle when Gardner's sister informed him via written letter. The timing of such a letter could not have been better. Doyle was in the process of writing an article about fairy sightings for popular British magazine The Strand. The world-famous creator of the literary character Sherlock Holmes and a trained physician, Doyle was, despite his reputation as a man of reason and science, entirely invested in the idea of a hidden world, as was much of his immediate family. His father, Charles, had obsessively filled sketchbooks with drawings of elves, goblins, and leprechauns. Similarly, his uncle Richard was known for paintings and illustrations of fae folk, no doubt calling upon his Scotch-Irish heritage for inspiration. His own wife, Jean, dabbled in mediumship, claiming the ability to channel messages from the beyond via automatic writing. But perhaps more than any outside influence, the recent death of his son Kingsley and the soul-crushing carnage of World War I had moved Doyle to eschew his career in popular fiction and focus on research into the occult. It has been speculated that Doyle's sudden interest in spiritualism may have been brought on by a desire to actually communicate with Kingsley beyond the veil of death. On June 30, 1920, Doyle sent two registered letters to the Wright's house, one addressed to Arthur Wright and one to Elsie. The letter to Mr. Wright was professional in tone, though cordial. In it, Doyle requested the use of the photos for his The Strand article, offering to pay a fee of five pounds for the privilege, or about 215 pounds or 250 US dollars in 2018 money. Considering the circumstances, this was not a substantial sum. Not only was the Strand already contracted to pay Doyle a hundred times that amount, the photographs would undoubtedly provide his article on Parallel Gravitas, equivalent to the much later Patterson film in regards to Bigfoot lore. His letter to Elsie was much more informal, almost patronizing, and a thinly veiled attempt to entice her into future cooperation, complete with the gifting of a free book from his own bibliography. Dear Miss Elsie Wright, I have seen the wonderful pictures of the fairies which you and your cousin Francis have taken, and I have not been so interested in a long time. I will send you tomorrow one of my little books, for I am sure you are not too old to enjoy adventures. With best wishes, yours sincerely. Viewers should note this correspondence was directed at a 19-year-old woman. Regardless, receiving a letter from one of the world's foremost authors was an understandably momentous event for Elsie, and the Wrights agreed to Doyle's request. Unfortunately, Mr. Wright did not inform Doyle or the editors of The Strand about his somewhat skeptical opinion of the photographs, which, despite his wife's credulity, had not waned over time. This is less likely due to poor judgment brought on by starry-eyed fandom than a reasonable belief that the photos, if fake, would simply sell a few more magazines and quickly fade from memory. In the summer of 1920, Doyle left the country for Australia to participate in a series of seances, leaving Edward Gardner in charge of the continuing investigation. Strangely, at this point, Doyle expressed open doubt as to whether Elsie and Francis could duplicate their earlier feat. It seems he believed, as was a common sentiment among spiritualists, that though virginal girls were especially attuned to all things paranormal and mystic, the advent of Elsie's womanhood would forever cut her off from the fairy world. Despite Doyle's misgivings, Gardner did not disappoint, sending word of a great success in that three more photographs were produced. Doyle is impressed, though in responding to Gardner, he uncharacteristically points out, quote, it is a curious coincidence that so unique of an event should have happened in a family, some members of which were already inclined to occult study." Unquote. That this seemingly self-aware moment of insight was immediately shot down by Doyle himself as far-fetched and remote is both breathtaking and disheartening. Any pretense of his objectivity was, in those handful of words, erased from existence. To cloud the issue even further, Gardner freely admitted during his correspondence with Doyle that several other photographs had been taken by the girls but proved to be partial failures and were therefore not kept. This was indeed a curious policy, as one would think even a legitimate failure would support such extraordinary claims. The three photos alluded to by Gardner were produced under somewhat more controlled conditions, at least in Gardner's eyes. In late August of 1920, he supplied Elsie and Francis with a pair of cameo folding cameras, a type very different from that used in 1917. Along with the cameras, 24 photographic plates were supplied, all of which had been secretly marked to prevent tampering. Despite supposed bouts of rainy weather, several exposures were made on Thursday, August 26th, and again on the following Saturday. The three most striking examples, apparently those that were not deemed failures, were culled from the lot and hailed as the great success communicated to Doyle. 
A second final attempt was made a year later, this time using stereo and motion picture cameras. Although the culmination of considerable time and investment, this last push for evidence turned up empty, save for a report from a Mr. Hodson, an acquaintance of Gardner's with a reputation for seeing fairies and elementals. Mr. Hodson sat with Elsie and Francis and compared some of their sightings. Upon later reviewing their comparisons, Gardner found that although Hodson's descriptions were somewhat more detailed, their accounts more or less matched. Quote, he saw all that they saw, and more, for his powers proved to be considerably greater." Unquote. The Christmas 1920 edition of The Strand released to great anticipation, selling out all copies across England in three days. In his article, Doyle claimed he had studied the photographs long and earnestly with a powerful magnifier, and had declared a strong likelihood they were genuine. He concluded his essay with a bit of lofty sentiment, quote, these little folk who appear to be our neighbors, with only some small difference of vibration to separate us, will become familiar. The thought of them, even when unseen, will add charm to every brook and valley, and give romantic interest to every country walk." Unquote. Rather than convincing the British public en masse, many readers were simply gobsmacked as to how the creator of one of fiction's greatest detectives could endorse photographs that seemed so obviously fake, though not everyone was full of doubts. An expert of photographic fakery, H. A. Stadden, gave a probability of 80% for the published photo's authenticity, and, echoing the earlier endorsement of Mr. Snelling, technicians at the Kodak lab in Kingsway failed to find any evidence of superposition or other trick, although these same technicians added that they could have, with all the knowledge and resources at their disposal, likely reproduced the photos if they had wanted to. Anecdotes and personal testimonies aside, the bulk of any investigation into the Cottingley Fairies should focus on the only tangible evidence offered, the five photographs taken by Francis and Elsie. Much of the information known regarding the photos is due to observations and estimations made by Gardner in later reports. The first photograph is easily the most famous, an aloof young Francis surrounded by a host of little winged creatures as she stood in the shallow waters of the beck. Gardner claims the photo was taken on a bright day and with a short exposure time, but these claims are at odds with certain technical facts. Cursory examination indicates the lighting on Francis is diffuse and indirect, possibly due to either cloud cover or an abundance of overhead shade. This demonstrable difference isn't particularly damning, but it does indicate a somewhat careless attitude in Gardner's inspection. Because it correlates to experimental measurements and estimates, the quality of lighting in a photograph does have some influence on analysis. Whether Gardner knew this or not would obviously put the purity of his motivations into question, but perhaps it's best to give him the benefit of the doubt. The photograph was produced by a falling quarter-plate box camera, the Midge, made by W. Butcher & Sons Limited, a British camera manufacturer that produced many popular models at the beginning of the 20th century. Unlike cameras of later decades, the Midge used a rigid pane of glass treated with dry photosensitive emulsion, rather than a piece of flexible cellulose film. The term quarter plate referred to the size of the photographic pane used, in this case 3 and 1 quarter inches by 4 and 1 quarter inches. The midge was specifically a falling quarter plate because several glass panes could be loaded into a magazine, and once a photograph had been taken, an exposed pane would fall into a compartment in the bottom of the camera's housing and be replaced by the next in line via spring load. In regards to development requirements, the midge was a substantial technological advancement beyond earlier wet plate cameras, but the emulsion coating on the midge's glass panes required a comparatively long exposure of between one and a half and two seconds to work. Thus, the 1 50th second exposure time, as suggested by Gardner, was far too brief. Although it could be easy to conclude Gardner's mistake was deliberate, it is more likely Gardner assumed the high shutter speed out of ignorance of the camera's operation and a false assumption based on his own bias, as well as the early assessment of Mr. Snelling. As mentioned earlier, though Snelling insisted photo number one shows the fairies in movement, very few people ever seemed to agree with him apart from Gardner. In regards to this seemingly dubious observation, author and poet Maurice Hewlett stated, quote, we have all seen photographs of beings in rapid motion. The photograph does not look to be in motion at all, because in the instant of being photographed, it was not in motion." Unquote. Although Gardner scoffed at such objections and continually restated his beliefs that the fairies were indeed moving, it likely became clear to him that an explanation not based solely on an observer's opinion was necessary. The only way he could explain this discrepancy is the employment of a high-speed shutter. Consider, if one is observing a movie played at 30 frames per second and then snaps a photograph of the screen, a single crisp frame of the movie will appear on the resulting photograph, provided the shutter speed is 1 30th of a second or less. If said photograph was taken of the movie at a speed lower than the projected frames per second, in this case 30, the resulting photo will show a smearing of two consecutive frames, as both positions are, at least for a brief moment, exposed to the camera simultaneously. 
Although no one really knows the anatomical makeup of fey folk, it is reasonable to assume it would not be wildly outside the constraints of aerodynamic physics, and though admittedly pure speculation, it is commonly thought a fairy would move in the manner of a butterfly, rapidly and consistently. And in any case, unless they are soaring, even the largest birds will flap their wings at a frequency greater than once per second and a half. Surely then, Gardner realized photograph number one should show some smearing of the fairy's wings, unless it was taken at a high speed, hence his conclusion of a 1 50th of a second exposure. Unfortunately, in his zeal to explain the fairy's apparent lack of motion, Gardner neglected to explain the obvious blurring of the small waterfall behind and to the left of Francis, something of which even Snelling made mention. This could only be so if the waterfall was in motion and the fairies were not, at least for the one or two seconds of exposure time needed for the glass pane. In any other circumstance, the photograph stands as a a sharp contradiction to the girl's claims. The distance from the camera to Francis is also in question, as per viewfinder experiments performed by Brian Coe of the Kodak Laboratory in London. Using controlled comparisons, Mr. Coe determined the distance to Francis in photograph 1 was likely around 7 feet and not 4, as Gardner originally stated. The second photograph is of Elsie smiling at what appears to be a cavorting gnome. Gardner still gives a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second, likely based on his conclusions of the first photo. He also states the subject of the photo, Elsie, to be about 8 feet from the camera. Mr. Coe concurs with this observation, at least within a reasonable margin of error. One apparent anomaly in the photo is the seeming elongation of Elsie's right hand. This was noticed by Gardner as well. Concerned some mischief might be afoot, Gardner examined Elsie's hand and even went so far as to create a pencil outline. Upon noting that the young lady's fingers seemed longer than average, Gardner concluded, quote, The appearance of dislocation at the wrist I cannot explain, unquote. While a good attempt to throw light upon a possible discrepancy, a close examination of photograph number two yields a simpler and more tenable solution. Elsie's hands are simply positioned together in such a way as to create an optical illusion. Stranger still, upon examining the original glass negatives, it was determined the glass pane for photograph number two was too large to fit into the midge. Elsie's father was an avid photographer, and it is entirely possible he owned more than one model of camera, much as a passionate musician might own more than one guitar. Whatever type of camera that might have been used, if not the midge, has been lost to history. Photograph number three is again of Frances, this time sitting among the leaves as she watches a fairy leap through the air. Again, Gardner gives a relatively fast shutter speed of 1 25th of a second, the maximum setting for the cameo. He also explains the obvious blurring of Frances by stating that she involuntarily tossed her head back as the fairy leapt at her. He further explains the fairy hovered motionless at the moment of exposure and is therefore sharp and distinct. Upon later examination, Brian Coe noted the blurriness shown in Francis is consistent with a short movement during a long exposure, perhaps something on the order of one and a half to two seconds, a time very similar to that of the photographs made three years earlier. Although all parties agree the model of camera used in 1920 was different than that used in 1917, it is possible Elsie and or Francis simply adjusted the camera to the same setting in the hopes of duplicating their past efforts. Whether those efforts involved genuine fairies or something less fantastical isn't immediately clear. Photograph number four is perhaps the most well-composed of the lot, a candid shot of Elsie and a single fairy. Aside from the pleasing aesthetic, the photo has the unfortunate reputation of casting the most doubts upon the entire affair. As pointed out by Gardner himself, Elsie is not making eye contact with the fairy, nor even looking at the little creature at all. Rather, Elsie seems to be peering intently at the void behind. To be fair, the same oddity has been pointed out in the first of the 1917 photos as well, but in that case, Francis was at least looking directly at the viewer, so it could be explained as simply posing for the camera. In photo number four, the camera and the fairy are the only two objects of interest vying for Elsie's attention. That she is focused on neither is a telling incongruence. Gardner explains this away with equal parts ingenuity and desperation. Quote, the reason seems to be that the human eye is disconcerting. With fairy lovers, the habit of looking at first a little sideways is common. Unquote. As if such tortured reasoning didn't already strain the issue enough, Gardner gives no explanation whatsoever for the plain fact that the fairy seems outfitted in a scoop-necked flapper dress commonly found in that day and age. Also, perhaps more than in any of the other photos, the fairy appears to be unaffected by shadows or dappled illumination, particularly curious considering the copious amounts of foliage within the frame. Finally, there's the image known as the Fairies Take Their Sunbath, a close-up of meadow grasses revealing a cocoon-like object flanked by a pair of diminutive creatures. 
Gardner stated that sources known to him had identified the cocoon as a type of bath woven and used by fairies after dull weather, and that the interior stimulates and pleases through magnetism. How his sources ever determined such means of operation is a mystery, and certainly forces one to scratch one's head. Very little information is available to cast doubt upon photo number 5, though there is indication that some sort of double exposure may have been employed. Like the Midge, the Cameo-type cameras used a treated pane of glass as a photographic medium, though unlike the midge, the cameo held only one pane at a time, every photograph requiring to be physically loaded. The pane was held in place by a set of metal clips, which showed up as black semicircular shapes near the corners of the exposed image. A slight ghosting of the clips, as well as some of the features in the photograph itself, can be seen in the final plate, indicating that more than one exposure had been taken, with the glass pane having been installed a second time in the camera slightly out of position. Ironically, this second installation likely indicates the double exposure was an innocent mistake. Considering her background, it's very probable Elsie was aware of that particular photographic trick, which if carefully performed had the advantage of being convincing to the untrained eye and elementary in execution. If the intention was to make a double exposure, the pane in question would have simply been left in the camera and then exposed a second time without having to unload it first and thus risk altering the pane's registration, something Elsie would likely know. It is possible, then, either Elsie or Francis took a photograph of the fairies and their cocoon, unloaded the exposed plate, and inadvertently reloaded the same plate to take a second photo. Recall that although the plates were marked by Gardner, they had been done so in a secret manner, and may have been indistinguishable. The proverbial skein began to unravel as early as 1921, when a reporter from the Westminster Gazette contacted Elsie for an interview. Elsie reluctantly agreed, and, taking an afternoon from her job at Sharp's Christmas Card Manufacturing, she met the reporter for a brief, albeit telling, conversation. When asked about the fairies, Elsie claimed she was fed up with the whole thing. She insisted she didn't know where the fairies came from, and she didn't know where they went after the encounter. When prodded for details, she gave vague answers, concluding with the cryptic statement, You don't understand. Fifty years later, Elsie was again interviewed about the matter, this time by BBC TV, and this time stating that she would not swear on the Bible that the fairies were really there. Later, in a letter to Brian Coe of Kodak London, she admitted that, quote, I may not believe in fairies. As for the photos, let's say that they are figments of our imaginations, Francis and mine, unquote. In 1978, writer and paranormal investigator Robert Schaefer commissioned a computer analysis by William Spaulding, Western Division Director of Ground Saucer Watch. Using the same digital enhancement methods as that used on various UFO photo analyses, Spaulding determined most of the fairies in the photos were composed of two-dimensional images, lacking the same quality of visual depth found in the photographed girls. Strings were also detected on some of the subjects, an obvious red flag in regards to the reality. Oddly, the gnome in photo number two indicated dimensions similar to Elsie. Considering later developments, it was most likely due to either the gnome being a physical model or some sort of a dimensional relief. To further the opposition, in his 1982 book Flim Flam, illusionist James Randi proposed the hypothesis that the girls, particularly Elsie, had copied the images of the fairies from a very popular children's book, Princess Mary's Gift Book. Although probably the first to state the hypothesis plainly, Randy was not in fact the first to point out the existence of the images. British author and ardent spiritualist Fred Geddings had come across one of the illustrations by Claude Shepperson while researching a book on 19th century line art. Geddings had noted the drawings connected to a particular poem in Princess Mary's gift book bore striking similarities to those in the Cottingley photos. Perhaps the final nail was driven into the coffin in 1983, when Elsie wrote a letter to photographic journalist Jeffrey Crawley, who himself had recently penned a series of highly researched, yet ultimately critical essays about the Cottingley Ferry in the British Journal of Photography. Elsie praised Crawley for his journalistic acumen and expressed her long-sought desire to finally reveal the truth. As speculated earlier by James Randi, the two girls made fairy illustrations based on those within Princess Mary's gift book, a copy of which Francis owned. They then cut out the illustrations, and using bits of string and the ubiquitous hat pins found in a house full of women and girls, fastened them to whatever was convenient – sticks, leaves, and trees. That so many people found the photographs convincing was a fact neither of the women could reconcile. It was never clear of the original motivation for the put-on, but there is no reason to believe it was anything resembling malicious. Even Polly Wright, who could be blamed more than any one single person for stoking the flames of gullibility, was only motivated by a sense of wonderment and hope. Curiously, though Elsie unequivocally stated all five photographs were fake, Frances continued to claim, until her death in 1986, that the fifth photo, the fairies take their sunbath, was indeed genuine. 
to immediately discount the first four photos because of the admission of Elsie and Francis, while simultaneously refusing to take as authentic the fifth photo, using essentially the same criteria, seems somewhat inconsistent. Of course, the fact that Francis had perpetrated a lie for the better part of a century would call into question her trustworthiness on any subsequent revelations. One could hardly be blamed for not believing Francis if she predicted an imminent sunrise. It should be noted that the withholding of the true nature of the first four photographs does make a certain degree of logical sense. Revealing the photos as a hoax would steep not only Elsie and Francis, but their families in something of a minor scandal. It is clear from later statements that Elsie had great affection for her father in particular, whom she knew never believed the fairies to be real. He was, in fact, said to be openly disappointed that someone like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle could believe in something so ridiculous. It is possible that implying her father, a man known for his competence, to be someone easily duped when he was likely going along with the whole affair only to protect Elsie's reputation would devastate him socially. Perhaps Elsie and Francis feared the prospect of being made public pariahs. How many of us would want the mischief of our youth to haunt us in our later years? How many people would suddenly turn into spiteful enemies once they were shown to be fools? But once the threat of social ostracism waned and the truth came out, Francis simply had no reason to continue the charade. So why did she claim the fifth photograph was legitimate? If we consider the early moments of Frances's life, the temporary loss of her father and the uprooting and transfer to a strange land, the possibility of Elsie having a great deal of influence, almost dominance over the younger cousin, becomes plausible. It is possible that Frances had convinced herself of the fifth photograph's legitimacy, even if it was objectively no more real than the first four. Yet it seems equally likely that, once completely out of Elsie's shadow, Frances decided to exercise her own personhood and play the contrarian, stating something at odds with Elsie and making her own mark on history. Of course, it is also possible the fifth photograph is in fact genuine. We shall never know definitively, though considering the means, motives, and opportunities available to two highly intelligent girls, the uncritical belief system of Polly Wright, Edward Gardner, and the presumed king of deduction himself, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, it is a reasonably safe bet that the only fairies bathing in the sunlight were inside the mind of the photographer. That so many people, particularly people with academic training, were taken in by a mostly admitted hoax is, at first, mind-boggling, but given a little more reflection, rather than improbable, the idea seems almost inevitable. Young women in post-Victorian England were commonly thought of as more innocent and intellectually fragile than their male counterparts. Most viewers today would rightfully regard this sentiment as absurd, and that society as a whole has matured, though society's ongoing bigotry of low expectations does seem at odds with this conclusion. Many people of the early 20th century were not immediately aware of the trickery capable in doctored photos. Photography, like any technology, is a mystery to anyone unfamiliar, regardless of their intelligence. Imagine the reaction Benjamin Franklin, arguably one of the most brilliant men of the 18th century, would have if he was given an iPhone. We would certainly not judge him as an imbecile because of his initial bewilderment. Perhaps in the end, Elsie and Francis did photograph some bit of magic hidden from the rest of us, but even if they had faked the entire thing, we should at least credit them for their ingenuity and refrain from holding them accountable for the embarrassments suffered by the gullible. That many who were duped could not fathom the possibility of being victim to two seemingly unsophisticated country girls is a testament to human stubbornness of thought and the unwillingness to remember an oft-quoted bit of wisdom. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth.